Well, of course, once we're in the field, you have to have people supervising the research, usually a paleoanthropologist. And here's Bill Kimball again, who's in the field, uh, directing a team, uh, keeping track of what's happening, working very closely side by side with a geologist. Chris Camposano is a geologist at Arizona State University and uh, who is instructing a group of young students who are doing a field school here. Kay Reed on the right is a professor at ASU and uh, working closely with students and local people on identifying fossils as they're coming out of the ground. She's a paleontologist and studies uh, largely non-human fossil bones. But of course there's always time to kick back and relax if you don't mind playing frisbee in the late afternoon in about 100 degrees. Uh, we bring frisbees to the field for a little distraction or set up a ping pong table to end the day. And here you see some of our uh, expedition members playing frisbee. In the middle of the day, it's brutally hot. Uh, most people seek shade. There aren't many trees, so you usually find them in the work tents. But here is a tree with a little hammock in it and some seats in the shade if you want to make notes in your notebook. Uh, overlooking the river. There are briefings frequently to the entire team, uh, not only by uh, some of the scientists like Bill Kimball in the background, but also some of the local people who tell us about local customs and uh, local developments and uh, their impressions of what's going on. We bring with us uh, as much medicine as we can. Everyone has to take anti-malarials. It's a very high malarial area, so each day people take anti-malarial pills, and uh, a couple of people with a little medical knowledge uh, dispense medicine to people who ha might have an infection or some ailment or another, and uh, this is our sort of makeshift little emergency room where people will show up and ask for particular medication. Some people take the chance in the afternoon, one of our former students, in the afternoon to stretch out in the hammock and to relax after uh, working from about 7 in the morning till noon. So five hours out in the sun uh, is quite a bit of time and then coming back into camp for lunch at 1 o'clock and then by 2 o'clock there are a couple of hours of downtime and people can uh, regain their energy. At night uh, usually people go to bed early or work in some of the work tents the local Afar people like to uh, put on a performance for us at night. Here you see them uh, dancing and singing uh, we're at a large bonfire that was built. This was a weekend. And others, as I said, spend time in the work tents. We do have electricity because of the uh, solar panels and there are geologists and paleontologists in this picture who are catching up on a backlog of work in those work tents and keeping things current. Some students, uh, one of our student here, students here is preparing a specimen that was collected in the field and removing the stone matrix that was covering it and appropriately using a headlamp uh, to illuminate the very important fossil that she's working on. Saturday nights is usually uh, movie night and uh, we set up a computer, a fairly small screen, but we set up a computer and uh, someone has brought a movie along and uh, those who want to watch can come and sit and uh, relax on a Saturday evening. The nights are absolutely glorious. Uh, I set up my camera, a little time exposure here, a familiar constellation, which is Orion and two accompanying stars, Rigel and Betelgeuse. And uh, it's wonderful to just sit out in a chair at night when it's so dark away from the city lights and see the sky as you just don't see it when you're in a urban area. The river itself is a source of uh, cooling down and sometimes taking a, a bath. Uh, here members of the uh, student group that were out there in a field school are out swimming and uh, in the river and in cooling down. Uh, there are crocodiles like this. It's a fairly small crocodile as you can see sitting out here but um, they're not very large and maybe only a couple, three feet, three and a half, four feet long. And they pretty much, when they hear your splash in the water, they take off and don't bother you. Where I had worked in southern Ethiopia, some of these crocodiles were so large, their heads were like two feet long 
you never went into the river, but it's a nice thing to have. Uh, sometimes we have filmmakers come and uh, shoot footage of the field. And what's nice is many of these people have never seen themselves on video. And uh, here um, this woman is rebroadcasting or showing uh, some of the footage she shot. And everybody, of course, is immensely interested looking at uh, the videos of themselves. Most afternoons are spent, as you can see, in the work tent. Uh, I am using a little microscope to work on a fossil that was found, and I'm working on cleaning up that particular, Im particular specimen. The local people, the Afar, as I said, are Muslim people. They have interacted and worked with us ever since we first went to this site way back in 1972. This is um, one of our great collectors. He's an amazing, was an amazing man. He's deceased now. But every afternoon he would come into the work tent and spend two hours just going over casts, plaster casts of things that had found we had found previously so he could really understand what they looked like. And he would use this search image as he went out and he was responsible for finding quite a number of important fossils. Here's a hairdressing day. A guy has come into camp and he's having his hair fixed up, one of the Afar guys. And uh, they uh, love to be around us and learn from us and uh, to tell us about their world. And to they feel part of the expedition. They feel that they're contributing a great deal. And interestingly, they believe that the fossils we're founding, finding are probably very ancient Afar people, and those people were the ancestors for all of humanity. Uh, generally, they live in this very difficult uh, landscape, as you can see, uh, very barren landscape, very desert-like. They carry their homes with them. They're, here you see their pieces of um, thatched grass uh, that are put over bent pieces of wood. These are their little huts that they live in, and these are put on the backs of camels and moved from one place to another. They're a remarkable group of people, the Afar people. They've lived here for we don't know how long, but uh, this is their territory, and uh, they are very proud that we are finding these extraordinary discoveries. They take great pride in the way they dress and the way they decorate themselves, the way they look, and uh, we have long-term friendships, as I said, with these people. This was taken many years ago by a photograph I took of a young boy whose father worked for us, and now he himself works on a regular basis for the expedition. Uh, regularly, our workers will have their families visit. Uh, here you see husband and wife and uh, their baby. They came to camp. He was so happy to show off his, his daughter to all of us and to bring his wife to our camp and show us uh, what he was doing and helping us on this expedition. Uh, here is another member of, an exped of the expedition who's been with us for, for quite a number of years, Omar. And uh, Omar has brought his beautiful little daughter um, to show her where his, her dad works and to uh, show her off to uh, all of us. So these are long-term friendships and collaborations that uh, have lasted many years and are always filled with great excitement when we return to the site year after year. The local people uh, keep a great number of goats, which is the source of much of our food. We buy these goats and uh, depend on them for uh, meat. And uh, here they are watering uh, in uh, one of these riverbeds. The goats are kept uh, by the Afar, and uh, if they, uh, if we give them one of these goats for their, their meals, uh, they will slaughter it in their own way as Muslims, and we will have a Christian slaughter the goats for us uh, in the, on the kitchen staff. And here you see one of these goats uh, that has been recently dispatched, and they're removing the skin, and Ali, one of my great friends who is tasting some of the meat uh, just as it's uh, come off of that goat. He brought his son uh, to our camp. He lives in one of those little tents in the back, and his son spent a couple of days with us. It was quite an adventure for him. We work uh, cheek by jowl, really, with the local people. This is Jerry Eck, retired paleoanthropologist now, 
who is explaining the differences between different kinds of teeth in some of these fossils uh, to one of our collectors um, who are just sucking up every bit of information that they can on these expeditions. Some of our students who so enjoy having a first-hand experience in the field. Uh, this is Amy, sort of dressing up with one of those Afar knives and a, <laughs> a, a gun on her shoulder uh, and uh, having a photograph taken out on that landscape. Two different ways to do geology. <laughs> the guy on the right doesn't seem to be very worried about skin cancer, but the guy on the left always wears a shirt. Two geologists uh, who have been with us for a number of years uh, importantly keeping track of uh, all the geology, all of the fine spots where we recover these fossils. The teams are rather large and consist of a multidisciplinary group of people from geologists, uh, stratigraphers, um, archaeologists who look for stone tools, uh, paleontologists who study various groups of animals like elephants, rhinos, gazelles, monkeys, so on, uh, paleoanthropologists. We even have people out there who are working uh, on collecting sediments and hoping to extract from them pollen grains, for example, that tell us something about the vegetation. And this is at the end of the field season. After two and a half months in the field, you can imagine that uh, all of us are ready for a little R&R &R somewhere. This is our kitchen staff and uh, one of our drivers on the right, Mesfin. We've come back to Addis Ababa, the capital of, uh, of Ethiopia. Uh, and after getting cleaned up and dressed up in city clothes, they've come by to be paid and to say their goodbyes. And uh, now is the time for us to unpack all of our equipment, put it back into storage, and to uh, accession or put in the museum all the fossils we discover. We take none of these abroad. These fossils are important Ethiopian antiquities, and they reside in the National Museum. Here you see a group of human fossils that we found, and we're all discussing uh, what they are, what their range of variation is, and so on, and getting ready to formally deposit them uh, for self safe storage in the National Museums of, Ethi of uh, Ethiopia. We do many of our preliminary uh, observations and uh, measurements and so on uh, in the National Museum and record them directly into computers, as you see me doing here, working on a lower jaw, making observations, taking measurements before we get ready to head back home. This is uh, Yoel Rack, an Israeli colleague who is a specialist of uh, skull anatomy and uh, he's working side by side with a local Ethiopian scholar, uh, teaching him how to make copies, plaster copies or molds of these fossils, and also teaching him a little bit about the anatomy of the specimen itself. The fossils uh, are all stored in the museum, as I said, and importantly, the uh, hominin fossils, the human fossils, are stored in uh, trays like this, which are closed in uh, very thick safes uh, made of uh, steel, so they uh, will be safe, and they're all labeled and put away and available to scientists from anywhere in the world to come and study. So after two and a half months in the field, people begin to disperse and go back home and begin to process all of the observations they made in the field but I hope this gives you an idea of the trials and tribulations, challenges, rewards, and enjoyment of being in the field searching for these valuable specimens that tell us so much about our ancestry.